everyone, welcome to this special interview episode here on Collider with the writer and creator of this new show from Netflix called Living With Yourself that stars Paul Rudd. He is an Emmy Award winning and Peabody Award winning uh, gentleman, and I'm excited to talk to him about this show. Timothy Greenberg, welcome. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. Yeah. yeah well, I like it. I like it. It's a good reaction. You're very chill, very relaxed, ready to go. I'm good. You're not man. sure where the questions are. <laughs> We're going to get into it. Uh, listen, the first thing I want to ask you about this show is this what was it like uh, to get Paul Rudd to be a part of the, How did Paul Rudd get involved in this? And what, was your, what were your impressions after finishing working with him on this season? I mean, it was like a dream come true to have him do this, you know, mm -hmm. years ago, long before we had any reason to think that Paul Rudd would do this. I was just a guy writing this thing in my bedroom. Right. Um, he, and then, you know, once we started to think who might be good for it, he was at the top of our list. Mm -hmm. And then it was many years until there was even a chance that we might be able to get him. You know, once basically we got to Netflix and mm -hmm. the, you know, the high profile and the money that they have, well, he was the first one on their list too. And we sent it to him and he liked it. And that was incredible. Yeah. I mean, it really was pretty amazing. I'm as big a fan of his as anyone, you know, I love him in anything. So I, yeah. I was, you know, it was perfect. He really goes to a lot of uh, interesting new places as an actor through your, yeah. through your scripts, through your, the, the, the show. Uh, what impressed you the most about working with him? Cause I mean, he's creating two completely separate characters here. I mean, uh, you know, aside from just, he's a good guy, which everybody talks about, mm -hmm. um, he would, there was two things. Obviously playing the two characters, mm -hmm. it's a very difficult challenge yeah. to remember all of which character, to be able to switch between them, mm -hmm. to make the emotional reality of each character work, be able to convey that just with such fluidity, you know, based on our production schedule, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. But like for me personally, it was that I would find in his performance, I'd be sitting on set with a hundred people around. I was the one who wrote the thing and his performance would sometimes bring me to tears, you know, or I would sometimes even think like, wow, my heart is really breaking for say new miles mm -hmm. in this scene in a way that I hadn't fully envisioned. And yet the way that he played it, I'd be, I'd be Harper. I, sometimes I'd come up to him like, I, I'm so sad for new miles right now or for miles. So the fact that he was able to do that, I, I know it's just a make-believe story, but uh, I just thought he was so compelling. And it's perfect casting because like uh, Miles, and we should say this, uh, the show itself deals with this gentleman, this guy named Miles. He's a man struggling with his life. He's going uh, uh, through a midlife crisis. He gets a tip to go to this spa and he discovers that if he puts $50,000 down, uh, this new version of himself can come out. What he discovers is that the new version of himself is a clone. So now he has to, in essence, have this eternal struggle that we all have uh, with ourselves between the idealized version of ourselves and who we actually are at this time in our lives. And I wonder if that was, did you write this? Because I know the show came from a dream that you'd had recurring as a child, but did you write this show at this time in your life or when you started writing it? Was it to deal with your own kind of versions of yourself that you were struggling with or were you working out some yeah. stuff during the show? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, in my... I found that that question of who you are as a person, mm. are you a good person or less than good? You know, are, the, are you the idealized version or not? Right. Like the stakes were raised once I was married and had kids. You know, it's one thing if you're a jerk alone in your apartment. Uh, it's, it's something else if you're anything less than wonderful to the people that you love. Right. And yet, ironically, those are the people that we often are less than wonderful to, you know, including not just significant other and kids, but our families, mm -hmm. you know, our mm -hmm. brothers and parents. And why do we do that? Um, and so, yeah, it became a really daily question for me. And, and, um, I feel like that was what was interesting about this idea that I'd had, which is more fantastical premise, mm -hmm. but marry that to the kinds of things that I was struggling with every day in my real life. Yeah. And you can see that and it comes through when you're watching the show. And I think that's once again, why you cast someone like Paul Rudd, because this could easily have been a maudlin show, a depressing show, but actually uh, having his lightheartedness and his charm as he struggles with the very real emotions of confronting the life that he's currently living and this version of himself that he wishes could take over his life uh, is fascinating to watch. And as you said, 
you feel that sympathy for this guy. You, right. you, you ache for it, both of them, even though he's kind of a jerk yeah. half the time or yeah. most of the time in the show, you still feel sympathy for him because his intentions are good. He just is clumsy and going about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, I think where that's particularly an issue is like in the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so yeah. before he has a real problem to deal with. He's a bit of a meh, as mm -hmm. I saw somebody say, like, <laughs> I think Paul Rudd helps you a lot there. People come in with a lot of love for Paul. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think that gets you through that period until Miles, who seems like he's kind of got a lot going for him. So why is he such a downer? At some point, he's got a real problem. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. He's really got something to deal with. Yeah. Personally, I think at that point, the viewer uh, you know, goes along with him and starts to empathize, sympathize with his situation. Right. But yeah, God knows that, that Paul helped that immensely. There's so many references. You talk about this. We go along. There's like Blade Runner. It feels like there's a little Blade Runner. This idea of replicants and uh -huh. clones. This eternal sunshine, the spotless mind, the study mm -hmm. of erasing memories mm -hmm. or, you know, having memories put back mm -hmm. into your brain multiplicity. Hell, there's even a Gemini man uh, yeah, kind yeah. of connection here with this idea of looking at the younger version of yeah. yourself. Um, how how much of that uh, uh, did you intentionally put into the script? How much of it was just uh, subconsciously appearing as you were writing it? The script? Well, the I mean, show? the idea is not mm -hmm. new. I mean, it goes back to Dostoevsky and right. before that, you know. Of course. Um, um, Look, I had that, like I said, I had that nightmare as a kid, you know, mm -hmm. clearly it's something. Um, um, th there are certain, I have certainly a lot of influences, I would say. I tried not to rip off people. I didn't feel but, that way at all. No, it was, they were great, nice, winking, I'm subtle sure influences. I, yeah, I'm, I mean, you can't avoid it. But like, you know, uh, certainly I love Eternal Sunshine. Yeah. People strangely don't seem to connect it to adaptation where there is actually two. I don't know. I, I, I kind of agree. It too. feels more tonally maybe like Eternal Sunshine or a little yeah. bit. Uh, yeah. So, and I don't even really think of it as in terms of adaptation much, although that's obviously the better reference. Um, I saw the, the movie Moon. Um, oh, right. That's another one. A couple years. I don't know exactly the timing, but sometime mm -hmm. before I started writing this. Right. And uh, I think it possibly reminded me of those childhood dreams, but I love that movie. And that's another one that definitely deals with identity and, mm -hmm. and somebody finding out that they're not who they, who they think they are, you know, which for me is like a very compelling story. However you set it up, whatever science fiction premise you use to set that up, I'm just fascinated by the idea that, that to some degree you are not who you think you are. And I think that's sort of true in reality in our daily lives, but just in that, what if, Oh, what if, Turns out I am a clone, or that I am something else. Like that's right. a story that I I love and is terrifying to me. So, well, yeah. then I think that's why the show works so well because it works on multiple levels. If you've done any kind of psychotherapy or therapy or any kind of exploration of of yourself, the show speaks to you very well because this idea of the idealized version, then the current version, but the idealized version is just what you think is right, but that doesn't mean it works for everyone else. Right. Uh, one of the two of the, my favorite scenes in the show are with uh, Miles' wife, Kate, who's played by uh, Ashling B. Um, the scene in the bathroom when she says to him, like, um, you're just too perfect. You're, everything's just so right about you. And we think if I just adjust these things that I'll get loved all over again, it'll change everything. But the truth is the muck and the mire of the relationship is the foundation of the relationship. It isn't just always in the happy times that you find the true connection. Yeah. I mean, I think their shared, even their shared suffering provides a basis. Exactly. Know? Um, and yeah, anybody who's too perfect, isn't that fun to hang around? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, the people that you want to hang around with are the ones who have a sense of humor and the ones who have a sense of humor are usually the ones that are going through something, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, I, I just, that with, from those scenes, I just kind of imagine what would you be like if you had no fear, which I think is kind of the trick with Miles, if you hadn't experienced directly mm -hmm. the pain of life. You, know, you have the same memories, but I think it's different to experience the, have been there, to really at some deep level have suffered. Yeah, And uh, so I think the kind of person that hasn't gone through that would be a bit annoying, you know, <laughs> I do think that. Well, Ashley, who I just mentioned, she is such a standout in yeah. the show. Yeah. And to me, she's the one that like, of course, you know what you get with Paul Rudd, but Ashley B is the reason to watch this show because she has to carry 
dealing with this idea, right? And of course, Miles keeps accusing her that she's making about herself, but she is the one that is the most of the focus for yeah. both of these guys throughout the show. Um, how did you go about getting her onto the show? How did she get cast? Like, what was the situation uh, with Ashley B? Uh, you know, I think a casting, a casting director. Okay. So you'd never worked with her before? No, or okay, no. Um, okay. And right away, uh, you know, we looked at a lot of people, mm -hmm. a lot of good actresses. Like I was really humbled by the fact that all these actresses who I was really big fans of were reading these scenes of mine. Mm -hmm. I also was wincing at some of the dialogue. I'm like, okay, I got to rewrite that. <laughs> so some of them actually did some things that I was like, I'm going to steal that. Thank you very much. Um, and, and then Ashing, who I'd never heard of, mm -hmm. I think she like self, literally self tape, like had it on a phone or something. Wow. And she just, she just killed, you know? And I think what we saw in that initial, you know, self tape of hers on one scene, mm -hmm. um, uh, we see in the show. Uh, and I mean, also that scene, the one she did wasn't particularly funny. Uh, so as soon as, you know, we went right to the, the internet and started investigating her, mm -hmm. turns out she's a comedian. So I watched everything she had done. And then I went and watched all of her previous stuff. But yeah, um, yeah she was, she's great. And yeah. I really do think so. Yeah. And I, to be honest, like it, we knew it was, she was doing great on set, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until we cut it all together that I went, wow, this, she is really, be amazing. <laughs> I te I remember I emailed her going like I, I don't you haven't seen any of this yet, but yeah. I'm telling you, you are really fantastic in this. <laughs> Did you go like good job, good job? Getting it was her. via email, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. This is good. Um, one of the, one of the, I think one of the other things that this film really, I mean, the show rather, uh, really uh, explores is that is this idea of. Uh, mental health and depression. Um, did you have any idea of bringing in a psychiatrist character or a therapist like Paul? I mean, sorry, Miles being in the middle of this uh, therapy session or middle of therapy, and then this being like just this desperate attempt to deal with it in some uh, extreme way. Uh, well, I answered part of your question first, okay. and I'll continue. I do kind of recall now that you mention it that in some really early version, yeah, I had like a psychiatrist and then each of the different she would run into i think the different characters and not know that they were different <laughs> and she was really freaking out about how this person had such different personalities and was really causing a problem for her i don't remember the whole story but it was pretty funny it just felt like it was it was too far off right um uh, but you know, I've now seen, cause I've been reading some of the Twitter responses from people and it's interesting. People talk about how this is a good metaphor for, or a story about, um, anxiety or depression. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of it in terms of mental health. Wow. I thought of it okay. in terms of my life. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe I, and I only saw a therapist many years ago for a couple months. Maybe it's time for a revisit. I don't know. Um, but I get it. I mean, mm -hmm. like, look, clearly Miles is depressed at yes. the beginning. Um, he is. And, um, and, you know, I think a lot of depression and um, maybe anxiety, I don't know, but like is about um, self-loathing, mm -hmm. you know, anger at yourself. That I know a lot about. Mm -hmm. and um, And so I think there's a, uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I think that there is a real connection there. And it's interesting that I, I did not have that in mind, but the fact mm. that people are getting that, you know, I guess shows that we're all a lot alike. You know? Yeah. As someone who's been through it and I had to, uh, you know, I was seeing two therapists to climb out of it when I had it in 2016, I found a lot of what Paul was doing, I'm uh, sorry, Miles was doing in the show, very reminiscent of some of the thought patterns and ideas that are this idea. Once again, what mm -hmm. you spoke about earlier, this mm -hmm. idea of, um, uh, how do people see us? Mm -hmm. How do we see ourselves mm -hmm. and people's expectations of us and our behavior right. and the pressures like, well, if I just do whatever they tell me to do, will I really be myself? And will I really be happy mm -hmm. being this other thing? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what uh, Miles explores so well in the show is this, okay, I, I, even when he gets the chance to do what he wants to do, he mm -hmm. hasn't addressed the problem. Even when he gets to sit around and, you know, watch porn and and do what and watch dog videos or whatever and start to write, he's still not happy, even though he's right. doing everything he wants to do. Why? Because he's missing out on these other pieces of his life that that are essential to make him happy as well. He's not addressing the core issue, which is what is the depression uh, usually stems from is that you're not addressing the core issue. You're just papering over the cracks. Yeah. And, 
uh, the creation of the Miles clone is papering over the cracks. Yeah. And so I love how your show explores how they battle physically and verbally throughout uh, the series. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly right. Mm. I, I, th I think that, um, you know, we have this idealized version of who we are mm. and our failure to live up to that can cause us to beat ourselves up. Yeah. You know, um, and can cause us to hate ourselves sometimes. And mm. so I, that's kind of, this is the, the, the real world version of that is what if there were yeah. another you in the world, how would that make you feel? Right. You know, like, I don't think it would make you feel that great to see this better version of you that now you now actually have to live up to. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's only when Miles starts trying to live up to it and not, you know, somewhat, I guess, in competition, but more just he's doing these things because he feels like these are the things that he wants to do, you know? Right, right. And like, yeah, I mean, the thing that makes you happy is not have, you know, playing video games and sitting around. Mm -hmm. It's doing something positive, whether it's achieving something or where it's doing something positive for someone you love or in the world, like those are what make you feel better. Mm -hmm. It's scientifically proven, you know, that if yeah. you go out and do good things for other people, you will feel better. And if you sit around and act selfishly and just play video games and order pizza while somebody else is going to, you know, go do the good things in the world for you, mm -hmm. you will be unhappy. That's, we, we know that and science shows that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. The other uh, thing that you uh, explore throughout the show is uh, Kate's journey here yeah. as well, because she is dealing with the disappointment of this marriage. And we do go back in time and see the miscarriage and how that affected their relationship. We don't see fully why Miles is in this condition at this time. And I think that's why you, once again, why you cast someone like Paul, because Paul brings all those levels in as you're watching yeah. him. But like her journey too is her journey of, of discovery, where she wants to, what's gonna make her happy, right? And so much so that she even goes on that douchey guy's website and creates the profile uh, for, for Dater and actually ends up having this meeting with the clone Miles, but she's trying to break out of this rut in yeah. her own way as well without taking the extreme choice. Yeah. Did, were you very conscious to make sure that that story was just as, as powerful in its own way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the main themes, call it, that I um, really like about mm -hmm. this show, and I haven't heard people talk about as much, is the idea of perspective. Yeah. You know, what if there were... Um, you know, I had tell this story of like, I've got a friend who's always yelling at other people in traffic, you know, get out of my, what, what are you cutting me off for? Like, I guarantee if there were him in the other lane, he'd be like, what is, what is this idiot yelling at me for? So, you know, and so the idea that there's two of you and yet you still conflict, what does that mean? I think that has to do with our perspective and where we're coming from in our day and our situations. Mm -hmm. As far as, as far as Kate, Ashling's character though, you know, I think I very consciously, and this is w why, you know, Ash, what, one of the things that, uh, a challenge that Ashling had and that makes her so great is you have to go through a number of episodes before you really get to see her perspective. Yes. And we very consciously were building up the desire and the audience to see her perspective, mm -hmm. you know, so that by the time it gets, you're like, oh, right. I want to know what's going on with her. And it turns out it's a lot more than the audience has yeah. been aware of or that either the Mileses have been aware of. Right. And I think that's a major theme for me. And I also, you know, Ashing talks about how one of the things she, she likes about the character is that, yes, look, I think that, at, that the character is in some ways sort of stronger and maybe smarter and in some ways better than, than uh, Miles. Mm -hmm. um, but she's got real problems too, you know? Yeah. Like some of those, as Ashing has pointed out, like some of her... Um, her strengths are also her downfall, you know, mm -hmm. that she's funny, but she uses that, that, that comedy to kind of create a distance between people instead of really dealing mm -hmm. with things, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, I think that's true for the character. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think actually she's got a ways to go. I mean, in the imaginary world of what happens <laughs> after these characters continue on, I feel like that her character actually has a lot to deal with that hasn't been dealt with, you know? Yeah, I think you drop a lot of seeds throughout the show that I look forward to a second season, a third season, if it continues and yeah. if enough people are watching and, I and, mean, you, all, and you want to write it, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, also, don't forget, that guy's got a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly, I mean, right. You this know. is his first TV thing, like, it, yeah, no, he no. started, right? And he's, yeah. he, he, 
was very clear from the outset. Mm -hmm. He likes stories that are arcs. He very intentionally never wanted to do TV that goes on and on, you know? Mm -hmm. And I agree with him. Like, I like a story that has an ending. I don't want to watch the end of a season and go like, oh, now I have to get all, <laughs> wait a year for this thing to come. And then you have to yeah. kind of reconnect it. Like, I like having a, an arc, you know? I always thought I would make movies. And then TV kind of sort of in the intervening years kind of got more towards, you know, cinematic Right. movie style, style storytelling. I also think though that like, and it's only kind of lately that that I've re fully kind of really internalized this. Like I feel the whole idea of seasons seems a little outdated in okay. the streaming world, you know? I mean, and also in the world where we have all these anthologies, you mm -hmm. know, American Horror Story, not that I've seen it, but it's about right. something different every year, you know? Or I mean, even The Wire kind of started it where they switch. Yeah, they you switched, know? that was great. So like, yeah. I feel like, I just feel, you know, I don't, I'm not saying that to think of any future things as like a sequel, cause that's mm -hmm. not quite right either. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, maybe it, it's a, you know, there are chapters in a book that are each episode and then yeah. there's a book and then maybe there's another book in the series. But it's like, it's, I think the idea of, of seasons is like, feels to me like sort of as somebody writing it a little outdated. Yeah, I understand that because we're yeah. transitioning into a new world where yeah. streaming is and, more a thing and people are watching more British stuff and British stuff is like three episodes, an hour and a half yeah. episode, like Luther yeah, yeah. and you're done with the season. Yeah. The season yeah, right? yeah. yeah and, and also obviously that's different for different kinds of shows. Sure. Certain kinds of shows like it totally makes yeah, sense yeah, yeah. Or, or even... Uh, to some extent, again, I haven't seen the second season of Stranger Things, but I, I watch, you know, like right. like some of those, you kind of, you get it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, whereas just for me personally, I feel like it's a little bit of an outdated way of thinking about it for making a show like this. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, there's a lot, there's a running subplot here. There's a lot of symbolism throughout the show, which I really enjoyed. I mean, the opening thing of him climbing out of the pit, the burial pit, which is in essence, when we find out later, it's actually him, Miles, climbing out mm -hmm. uh, of trying to climb out of his own life, uh, this old, uh, that essentially was burying him yeah. as well, the flies thing, which essentially mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. kind of infers that he's walking dead. The credenza we mentioned off camera, the credenza, of course, being part of the symbolism as well. But one of the big things uh, that I thought was interesting and that is ironic is that you have this running subplot, as we discovered throughout the show, that they want to have a baby. They want mm -hmm. to create a life. And here is the life that they have, in essence, kind of accidentally created, which is this clone. <laughs> and so this balance between this idea and now you end that way with, of course, because this is going to be a, a spoiler discussion, we, which we'll say at the but you end this way that they now have this new life that's coming into the situation so we've seen sitcoms of my two dads now we've got my two dads my mom and this is an interesting situation this idea of a triple parentage for the child if you do a second season are we picking up with the child already born in, in this or are we dealing with the pregnancy first throughout the whole second season i don't know, I, you know <laughs> I, what, what, what i'll say is i thought that the situation where on the one hand it's the best thing that could possibly happen because there's really right it's it's what they've wanted more than anything else other than maybe fixing their relationship but mm -hmm. um so it's the best thing they could have pot it's exactly what they wanted yeah and yet now they're stuck together right <laughs> and so even if there's even if we're not continuing the story just the idea that wow and that that final look on kate's face you know where this is the greatest thing but oh how is this gonna work exactly like i love that <laughs> yeah. notion right there um I was so it's to not see... all tied up you know i mean it's yeah. definitely you know this is going to be very very tricky whatever happens from here so i was certainly waiting to see what the last reaction of kate's face was that you yeah, were gonna yeah. linger on and then cut i yeah. was waiting and then when you got there i was like, oh this that's brilliant that's yeah yeah brilliant. i i love that yeah and we even <laughs> sort of drop out the music there so you can hear her go like Huh. Yeah, you sort of <laughs> yeah. you, you, you understand that it's wonderful, and then hold on, what's going to happen here? I, right. I, I, yeah, right. I really like that. Was there any? Uh, uh, was there an alternate ending that you were toying around with, where she doesn't, where she divorces him, or breaks up with him, or leaves for a while, or takes a break? Or did you always feel like no, you uh, had them staying together? At the I always end? had them staying okay. together. I like happy endings. If again, if you want to endings. imagine more story, mm -hmm. I. I, I don't, you know, okay. I, I don't know. They are, have not dealt with a lot of things yet, right. is in, in my view, you know. I think it's a strong statement, though, because that's how a relationship works, you yeah. know. At the end, yeah, there's the desire to leave, possibly at times, but you also have to take responsibility for what you've both created and how can you climb out of it if you want to save it. And you can tell by the end that Kate really does love Miles. And... Uh, it's that when he comes, look, look, 
The super freak dance is everything. I'm telling you, that's <laughs> right, the, that's right. the moment. See of, that. that's you right. see their connection. Because it looks yeah, yeah. like she's ready to leave him sitting yeah. on the stairs, right? Yeah. I don't I don't know what the what you had written there, but it yeah. seems like she's ready to leave him. And then he just says, let me just, and it mirrors, obviously, in a contrast, when they try to do the dance, uh, the clone Miles and her in the restaurant, because the connection she has instinctively is yeah. with the actual Miles. Yes. And that's why they flow so well together. Yeah, I thought, yeah, yeah I mean, I thought, both the dancing and the the failed lovemaking scenes. Yes. I feel like there is an unconscious um, relationship that you have with your partner mm -hmm. of many years that can be expressed in nonverbal ways. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously a lot of nonverbal ways um, <laughs> that uh, that you only really can have that whatever this what I'm saying their memory transfer process is that it doesn't it doesn't go that deep. You yeah. Know? yeah, and I think that there is some you know. There's something that they share that the other the mile new miles and her don't you know? who choreographed that who choreographed that scene uh it was a choreographer jenny shore she was amazing and she worked with paul and ashling um you know to kind of get moves that they were comfortable with and right. that, that we that she felt would would naturally come from the character and she you know she read it all and thought about who they were and then the three of them really really built it together and awesome. uh yeah she was fantastic did she tell you who who learned the steps quicker uh, no, I mean, I think it was clear because we, we did kind of watch some of the rehearsals as they yeah. were going along. Okay. They were both good dancers. I mean, we've all seen Paul right. dance in the Tain videos and other things. Yeah. But uh, Ashling, as soon as she started moving, and you know how you can tell somebody's a good dancer like immediately? Right. As soon as she did a few steps, like, all right, great. She's a good dancer too. The scene's going to work. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It yeah. totally did work. Um, were there any, as you were, and we'll get a wrap up here in the next couple of minutes, but as you were writing, as you were uh, going through shooting these episodes and being, you know, obviously uh, writing everything, did you make any changes? changes to the script as Paul and Ashley talk about in an audition process, you're re-editing and whatever, uh, as you were watching them read your lines, but is there anything as you were making the show that you changed storyline wise that was really uh, important? I don't think so. I don't okay. think we had that luxury because um, we were shooting it all out of order mm -hmm. and it's a pretty tight jigsaw puzzle. Um, <laughs> you know, for production, you sometimes got to chain things. Mm -hmm. You didn't get the scene or you didn't finish it in this way. So how are we going to deal with that? So there was some of that. Okay. And honestly, I don't even recall what it was. Um, but uh, yeah, you're, you're doing it more for production, not because we were learning things mm -hmm. about the show itself, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, and one last question here. Yeah. What, what, now climbing out of this, in essence, climbing out of your own burial pit of this, uh, what's your experience walking away from this? Uh, uh, show what's your experience and now that it's on now that it's out what did you like discover about yourself or learn about yourself miles what did you do? there's been a lot <laughs> going on this week with the premiere and the press coverage and everything else right and i've learned that i'm still both the better and worse versions of myself <laughs> it never stops it never stops yeah <laughs> you know yeah. that's who we are yeah um it doesn't matter where you are in life you know um we are both our better and worse selves yeah yeah now, there you go. And that's I think that's a great way to end. We are both our better and our worst selves. And this show absolutely explores that in hilarious ways, but also in very meaningful ways. So if you haven't seen Living With Yourself, please do yourself a favor. Watch this show. Thank you, uh, Timothy Greenberg, for stopping by to talk with us. It was really awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, my thank love. you. It's my pleasure, man. All right. Uh, see this thing on Netflix. Remember to like and share this video on your social media and subscribe to Collider for more interviews just like this. And we'll talk to you soon.